Hello friends, uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. This is Shweta, I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And uh, today in keeping up with the times of moving away from recycling, we are essentially gonna talk about uh, design for reuse and repair. Adam Reed, who is the Director of External Affairs at Suez Recycling and Recovery is gonna moderate this panel. This is the second panel he's moderating for us in 2020. Uh, you should check out the video panel section on our website to see the first panel that he moderated. This was uh, in January. And we have three panelists today. We have Rachel Gray, who's a behavior change manager at RAP. We have Kyle, who's the CEO of iFixit. And there's Brian, who's the global lead of innovation and strategic alliances at Loop. As usual, we will be taking your questions. So please head to the Q&A section you can start putting your questions right from the beginning and Adam will pick them up as and when they seem uh, relevant at that point in time. So yes, that's it. Welcome and over to you, Adam. Thank you, Sweta. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning if you're in those parts of the world that are darling in early. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, I seem to be hosting these things far too frequently, Sweater. You're clearly getting your money's worth. But uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy the breadth of the discussions that we have. So last time I was talking chemical recycling. Uh, before that, we were talking about global commodities. We've done sessions on behavioral change. Um, and who knows where today may end up. I think we're going to start talking repair. We're going to start talking refill. But I expect we'll probably end up talking about uh, COVID virus uh, and global commodities nonetheless, because they're such hot topics. So uh, looking forward to uh, your commentary. I'll do my best to A, get us finished by uh, the hour, uh, B, ensure everybody on the panel says something interesting, and if they don't, I will challenge them, uh, and C, I will make sure your questions are answered in the time available, if you ask them in the time available. That's all I can do. So uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, excellent panel, as Sweater has said. Uh, I'm thoroughly looking forward to it. Uh, two of these panelists I've not even met yet. So that's a novelty for, for a webinar. Um, although Rachel and I go back way, way too many years and that's enough said on the topic. So I'm gonna invite each of the panelists to uh, introduce themselves, speak for maybe five minutes, tell us about how they see this particular issue. Where are they on refill, repair, uh, refurb um, issues in general? What are their concerns? What are their hot topics? Where do they see the opportunities? What's bugging them at the moment? I think they're the kind of things that are going to get you as an audience uh, provoked and engaged. So first and foremost, I'm going to hand over to Kyle uh, and Kyle's with iFixit. So Kyle, you've got the floor is yours. Fantastic. Super excited to be here. Uh, I run iFixit. We are an online community of people teaching each other how to fix things. Uh, when I give this talk at uh, at conferences, I say I'm I'm here from the internet, <laughs> uh, but we're all we're all citizens of the internet here. Uh, so I fix it is a community of people teaching each other how to fix things. If you know how to fix something that maybe I don't, uh, you can you can post instructions. Uh, I uh, I'll give you an example. Someone locally gave me an espresso machine. It was a Starbucks barista espresso machine. I don't have any idea why Starbucks decided to name their coffee making robot the same thing as their coffee making humans, but they did. And this particular robot was broken. Uh, and so I, uh, I got the uh, briefs and I had no idea how these things were supposed to work. And so I did what any self-respecting tinker would do. I just started taking it apart. Got it in pieces, realized I didn't know how to fix it. But I took pictures of the process and I uploaded and I said, look, this is the disassembly procedure for a Starbucks barista. No instructions on how to fix it. Just this is how you take it apart. And I got a email the following week from a lady who said, hey, thanks so much. You helped me fix my barista. And I was like, I didn't teach you how to fix anything. She says, no, you don't understand. The line was clogged and I just had to open it up and I could see where the clog was. And I cleaned it out and I put it back together and it was good to go. And that's how you, know, you, you gain this information. We have communities of people that are completely disconnected around the world, but we are, we are connected by the things that we have. Uh, we're connected by the common Google searches. So if you search for, you know, my iPhone needs a new battery, hopefully I fix it comes up and we have a step-by-step -step guide that will walk you through the process along with a repair kit. Uh, and that's how we fund iFixit, we sell parts and tools. So for an iPhone battery, the kit contains all the tools and the replacement adhesive to glue the phone back together and you're good to go. And we have been leading the charge around the world for right to repair uh, reforms, both to uh, 
change product designs to make things easier to fix, uh, but also to make sure that companies are making parts and manuals available. Uh, we have legislation pending in over 20 different U.S. states. Uh, today, there are hearings in two U.S. states. There's one at one o'clock in Maryland. So if you're joining us from Maryland, feel free to pop down to Annapolis and testify. Uh, and uh, the European Commission has talked about how, as part of the upcoming Eco Design uh, Directive update, they want to look at improving repairability of smartphones. Uh, we're seeing product designs that are mixed across the line. We take, we take these gizmos apart and we rate them uh, from one to 10 on how easy or hard they are to fix. Samsung has settled on a product design that hasn't changed much in the last five years and is very difficult to repair and they don't make parts available. And that has led to dramatically lower resale values of Samsung phones compared to the iPhone, which is relatively repairable. So that's the kind of thing that we're advocating for. We wanna see a, a, a more robust, longer lasting world. On mute. There we go. I, I love a backstory, and you've clearly got a great backstory. Uh, I like the fact you're calling out Samsung live on air. That's great. Um, I'm just looking at my mobile. I, no, no, no comment. Who made it? Um, so, what's your what's your bugbear? What's your big ticket items that we, you know, if you could change one product stream or one manufacturer, what where would you go? Well, electronics are the real problem because they are so resource intensive to make. It's over. Uh, uh, 300 pounds of material to make your smartphone. Uh, and electronics are moving into everything. Uh, you take a refrigerator, maybe it would have lasted 20 years. It used to last 20 years. Now Samsung refrigerators have tablets built into them. And so you're like, well, the tablet would last three years. And so now my refrigerator has gone from a lifespan of 20 years to a lifespan of three years. Google changed the API for the calendar system on these Samsung refrigerators. Samsung didn't issue an update. And so after two years, all these Samsung refrigerators with smart TVs in them to show you your appointments for the day, uh, they're out of date, they're no, they're no longer valid. So as electronics move into everything, as software eats the world, we're going to take the life cycle that, that we are accustomed to and we put up with for electronics and it's going to encompass all of the products in our lives. And that's a real problem. So we have to address it at the head, which is things like smartphones and, and the devices in our pockets every day, because it's a harbinger of what's going to happen with the entire waste stream in 10 years. Thank you. I'm very worried about software eating the world. It sounds like a Terminator 5, um, and I should be very, very worried. Right, that's Kyle. Let's move on. Uh, I want to keep this moving fast. We're going to come back to to fixables and, and, and repairables in the, in the electronic sector in a moment. But Brian's up and Brian's going to tell us a little bit about Loop and some of the new initiatives around refillables. Great. Thanks, Adam. And uh, also very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, Loop is a company that I work for that uh, has been incubated by this organization called TerraCycle. TerraCycle has been around for about 20 years and its mission since its very beginning has been to eliminate the idea of waste, a very bold and ambitious statement, I know. Um, but what TerraCycle has been doing, uh, just to give you some proper context to what Loop is, has really been focused on you know, specializing in engineering collection and solution systems for what we call hard to recycle waste streams. So think of things like cigarette butts, used baby diapers, plastic wrappers around snacks, and really giving those things a new life. Um, there's oftentimes a misconception out there that only certain things are recyclable. Uh, the reality is the majority of things in the world are technically recyclable, but the reason most things aren't is really a function of economics. And what TerraCycle has been doing quite successfully in about 22 countries around the world is you know working with big brands retailers governments in creating recycling solutions for these things by also driving huge marketing and pr campaigns for these entities that are willing to subsidize uh ownership of uh, creating uh, uh, an end-of-life solution for those products uh about three years ago uh TerraCycle incubated what we call loop which is the entity that i work for uh, this was officially unveiled at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum last year. And what we have done with Loop is really uh, taken this idea of eliminating waste to a whole new level, where we've effectively transferred ownership of products and packaging away from you, the consumer, and transitioning it back to the manufacturer. So 
Uh, a simple way to look at that is looking at how things used to be uh, back in the days of the milkman, where it was very typical for the dairy company to own the glass jug and really just sell you the dairy product inside. Uh, and then, you know, that bottle would be securitized by a deposit. And as long as you, you the consumer, return back that product, uh, you get your deposit back. So, you know, basically since the 1950s and since the advent of plastics, uh, we obviously have entered a new age in the consumer goods space of what we call disposability. And uh, what Loop is doing is really trying to go back to that age before disposability and really working with big brands, retailers, and helping them transition away from what we call a disposable supply chain to a durable, reusable one, where we are, again, transferring that ownership of products and packaging away from the consumer and back over to the manufacturer. Um, we'd like to view ourselves as a global platform uh, that you know, enables retailers, whether you're a small retailer, a large one, a physical one, or a digital one, to make this transition to durable supply chain happen. Uh, we operate as what I like to say, both a catalyst in the system, as well as an engine in the system. Uh, we operate as a catalyst by creating pilot programs across the globe designed to make our brands, retailers, logistics partners comfortable with this whole concept of reuse, uh, but also operate as an engine by providing these entities with uh, an opportunity to handle back the used product by engaging in cleaning services, collection of those used items, uh, facilitating the return of deposits back to consumers, and uh, very likely uh, in the future, uh, expanding not just into cleaning of refillable packaging, but also refurbishing of products as well. So that's uh, the quick overview of, of Loop and uh, happy to uh, speak more about it later in this webinar. Thank you, Brian. Uh, really fascinating. Um, I should declare an interest because Sue is our one of the shareholders in Loop, of course. Um, and I'm thoroughly looking forward to the launch event soon and, and the scheme coming to the UK. And we can talk a little bit more about, about that in due course. But uh, tell me one or two of the brands that you've got, you know, on your platform already operating in, you know, whether it's New York or, or Paris, you know, who, who, are we talking every brand or all day brands or elite brands? What's, what, what, where do you play? Yeah, absolutely. So we work with a large number of entities such as Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Nestle, Coca-Cola, a majority of the world's largest consumer product good companies are supplying specific brands uh, in both the US and France, which is where we are live today. Um, we cover a wide, wide range of categories from the food and beverage space to personal care, home care products, uh, you name it, uh, basically anything that today comes in a disposable package in the consumer goods space where there's an opportunity to transition into a reusable package, uh, there's really an opportunity for Loop and, and we're really uh, growing our portfolio of products day by day, onboarding new brands and new retailers uh, from, from those entities that are interested in, in joining this journey with us. Cool. So later, I'm going to ask you about Hagen Dazs and the user experience, but I'm going to park that for a minute. Uh, bro, um, Kyle, I want to come back to you because there is a question already, and I thought, why not? Let's let's strike while the iron's hot. Phone manufacturers, many brands available, but should we be settling on one charging point uh, or one, you know, a cable, for example, to make life a bit easier? And what do you think about moves uh, that are afoot in Europe to to do just that? Yeah, I think it's great. Uh, it is incredibly frustrating uh, the variety of charge cables that we have in our lives, uh, the number of different charging bricks that we have. Uh, so going to a standardized plug is is a good thing. Um, you know, at the the it took the European Commission uh, sort of two bites at this apple to get it. It appears that I mean, this legislation is purely targeted at Apple, right? Uh, every other smartphone that you buy today has a USB C port. So this is saying, forcing Apple to do it. Where I get concerned is that probably the next wave that the manufacturers want to go to is away from a, a charge cable and they want to go to wireless charging. 
And, and when you do that, like wired charging cables uh, with you know, the, the little power brick that plugs into the walls of the transformer, those are about 95% efficient. They're highly energy efficient. You go to wireless charging and it's like 30% efficient. And so it, it, it is literally, if we switch from wired charging to wireless charging, you're going to have to bring new power plants online to, to make up for, for that difference. So we need to make sure that in the transition that we don't, that you know, someone like Apple doesn't say, well, you said that we can't have a lightning port on our phones anymore, and so we're going to ditch the wired charger completely. Uh, the other concern that I would have with regulation is, uh, like someday, maybe maybe five, ten years from now, we'll, we'll want to move from USB-C to the next thing, and we need to make sure that we allow room for innovation. But uh, I would say across the board right now, everybody switching to USB-C is not going to be a good thing for the world. Thank you. Uh, I had no idea about the inefficiency of the of the wireless charger. So uh, that's There's something a, we should be lo lobbying against heat. now. Yeah. So you put your phone on a wireless charger and you just feel your phone gets hot, the charger gets hot. All that is energy lost to heat. Uh, it, it, it's a it's a terrible idea. I'm on uh, some green electronics uh, standards committees where you know, it's the green sticker that go on your smartphone. And we proposed in those standards just banning wireless charging altogether. And Apple did not like that idea. <laughs> There I was thinking that the wireless charger was just a good way of heating my car. Um, so thank you for clarifying. Right, let's move on because Rachel's not had a say yet. And I've already got a wrap uh, and the agenda in the UK around both refillables, repairables, returnables. Where are we? What's happening? And, and how are consumers feeling about all this? Okay, so I'm Rachel Gray. I'm the behavior change manager at RAP. So um, how all of this sits with citizens or customers, consumers, whatever you like to call them, is, is absolutely part of what I do. Um, so if you don't know RAP, RAP is um, a charity, an NGO, and we work to create a world where resources are used sustainably. And the way we do that is largely through something called voluntary agreements. So this is where we bring together people from across the supply chain to work on a specific issue around a series of targets. So the areas we focus on are at the moment are food uh, and food waste prevention. We work on plastics um, and we work on clothing and textiles. So we focus specifically on products. Um, we do much wider work for the UK government on, on wider policy issues to do with waste and resources. But um, we work with people, you know, the, the big brands that Brian's mentioned through to the collectors, to the recyclers, the packers, the fillers, um, and everyone else in between. So when it comes to behavior change and, and let's call it reuse, but we've also called it refill, we've also called it repair. Um, the language around this is, is quite confusing for, for citizens, let alone the actions we want them to take. And I think, you know, as RAT, we focus in on those three product groups, partly because of um, climate change impact and partly because we can't do everything in the reuse agenda. So we have to focus somewhere. And I think um, what we're seeing is, you know, particularly around plastics, for example, there's lots of people wanting to do the right thing, but the choice is so varied and fitting it into your lifestyle is quite challenging. We're seeing a lot of inaction. You know, the same could be said of clothing. Quite a lot of people know clothing has, you know, a climate change impact but are struggling to work out how to make changes in their lifestyles to, to do that. And, and, you know, electronics repair. I think, yes, people would love to do it. And you'd meet people say, oh yeah, I really like to do that. Oh, but I don't have time. And, you know, I think, I think our challenge is to, to take what we want people to, to do is the right thing, whether it's to save money, save the planet, all of those things, and actually get it to do that in their lives. And I think the other area to be mindful is unintended consequences, which we've already touched on. You know, the simplest thing, like someone said to me that um, people are switching to more durable, reusable um, water bottles, you know, for, for refilling. Um, but if you've got kids, they go to school with one of those, and let's say, you know, they don't come back with it. So you're replacing a, quite a more carbon intense item or a, a metal bottle I think I saw someone drinking from a metal bottle with with something that has a huge climate change impact if you don't keep reusing it so I think unintended consequences are are, are really important thank you 
Um, now that leads me on to a question about life cycle assessment, which was originally for Brian, but I'm going to actually, I'm going to ask Rachel first because she's, she's, she's live. You know, you've just mentioned that, that a classic there about the aluminium bottle and, and whether we use it enough or not. And, and I think in the UK, you know, we've had a plastic bag tax, which has moved people away from single use plastic bags to bags for life, which are never for life because you forget you've got one. And so you get another one and we end up with bags for life. And I just wonder, you know, is there enough clarity around the life cycle analysis that has been done? And, and are we giving the very clear messages to the public? Because, you know, my mum, who I always use as a barometer of, of the public interest, just looks at me blindly and, and, and does, she thinks she's doing the right thing. But I wonder whether, you know, your example with the, you know, with the reusable water bottle, you know, how many times do I have to use that to honestly be confident that my carbon footprint is smaller? So, you know, are, are we giving the right messages and, and are, we, are we sure about the, the evidence base? So I think with life cycle analysis, as anybody who's listening or other panels know, you know, there are numerous tools and, and ways of doing it. It all relies on the data that goes into it and then how you manipulate it. So there is no simple answer, as most people know, um, because also every product has a different life cycle and transport. It is incredibly difficult to actually say this is the right thing to do and this is the wrong thing to do. And I think from a citizen perspective, you know, never, you know, explaining life cycle analysis is not something that, that will help people make their decisions. Um, so I think from our perspective at, at RAP, um, what we tend to do is give people the, the choice to make themselves um, in explaining it, not in too complicated way, but saying, you know, it's not easy. Um, we've just, so a little bit of a plug, we've just launched a new campaign called Clear on Plastics. And it's exactly that. And we have a question that we get asked all the time. We say, well, what material is better? And I'm sure um, Brian will know this. Is it a metal container that you reuse? Is it a plastic container you reuse? But what we're actually saying is it's complicated. The best thing you can do is keep things in use for as long as possible, you know, because we know that's good, particularly around clothing. The longer you can wear something, the better. And I think the average wear is, is, is less than three times for some of the fast fashion. So I think keep it in use for as long as you can is the message. Good messaging, Rachel. Thank you, Brian. So let's take, take up the, the opportunity here then. You know, Loop, no doubt, has had to do some serious analysis and thinking, even if it's borrowing other people's, to <laughs> understand, um, you know, the, the whole life cycle perspective on some of these containers that will or won't be part of your program. So the question is explicit about milk delivered in a glass bottle, mm -hmm. having four times the carbon footprint of a carton or plastic milk bottle. But broaden it, you know, answer that question by all means, but broaden it to a, you know, what kind of work have you done to look at the, the, the LCA around different packaging types that would fit within your program? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's a very good question. And as you can imagine, it's a question we oftentimes get. Um, so, you know, we, we indeed have done a lot of life cycle analyses. Uh, as Rachel noted, uh, each product, uh, you know, in the system has a unique LCA, life cycle analysis. These variables depend on, you know, what the package is made of, where was it made, you know, where is the cleaning facility with respect to the distribution center and the consumer's house. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, we have done uh, third party reviewed uh, LCAs uh, in partnership with our, you know, large corporate partners such as Procter & Gamble. Uh, as you could imagine, uh, these big companies that we work with, uh, it's very important for them uh, you know, not to be accused of, of things like greenwashing, uh, you know, which was uh, an issue that a lot of these companies had been confronted with uh, in the past. So uh, what we're seeing is a lot of these companies we're partnering with really invest uh, energy in making sure that they have dedicated LCA teams that really evaluate this stuff in detail. Um, you know, I, I oftentimes talk about LCAs and loop and, and use the electric vehicle charging industry as, as, a, as a great parallel. Because if you look at you know, LCAs of electric vehicles today, uh, in many parts of the world, given the fact that you know, the majority of the grid is powered by coal, one could argue that electric vehicles aren't as eco-friendly as gas-powered cars, right? 
But, you know, I think most people would agree that, you know, as we progress forward in the future, supply chains will, will become more efficient. The grid will get cleaner. Uh, there will be more charging stations uh, available for consumers to use. And inevitably, the LCA uh, as a system will improve. And I think it's really important to look at Loop in a similar way, where these pilot programs that we have today, you know, they're not operating the most efficient supply chains because we're really, you know, in this test and learn R&D phase of really stress testing, you know, all of the weird things that are associated with reuse and really, you know, working through that system. And, you know, as we progress in the future, um, you know, making sure that uh, it is progressing uh, efficiently so we do get a better LCA. Um, we do encourage our manufacturers to design their products and packaging to last a minimum of 100 cycles of reuse. Uh, because we look at Loop as a journey uh, for a lot of our manufacturers, the minimum that we require is 10 cycles. Uh, but we do really encourage them to go to as many cycles of reuse as possible. But again, uh, the key thing I want to stress that you know, we really do view this as a journey. And uh, you know, over time, uh, that LCA will be improving. Thanks, Brian. I think a journey is absolutely what we're on. And I'm just thinking, Carl. You know, I, the whole repairability agenda is something that's you know coming to the fore. But we're far from being at the end point, aren't we? I mean, how, how long a journey do you think we need to go on before we be, make this socially the norm for not only the design of um, our electric electrical equipment let's say but but also we design in a way that the consumer also does the right thing as well because it's all well and good to have a design that's great but if the public are still doing what they've always done then the system becomes ineffective so you know Carl what do you think about the journey that we're on with electrics and repair in particular yeah in some places we're close in some places we're really far away uh, you know, the, it, the nice thing with electronics, we have a model to look at. The, your, your classic PC tower from the er, you know, 90s, early 2000s, that is a paragon of reuse uh, and, and recycling. It, they are modular. They're easy to upgrade. Recyclers uh, uh, love them because they have enough commodity value in them uh, to make it worth their time to manually disassemble. So that's, that's where we would like to be. The challenge is as products get, get smaller, there isn't material. Like if you want to take uh, uh, your iPhone or your smartphone and, and recycle it, the actual commodity value inside that phone is about 20 cents. It's, it's almost worthless. So uh, the, only, the only value, the only thing that we can do is figure out how to extend the lifespan of these things and focus on reuse rather than recycling. Um, and, and there are uh, some opportunities. There's a lot of things happening. Thank you. I, that's quite interesting. So we've had an analogy that was talking about uh, electric cars, and now we've got an analogy of me going back to having a desktop, which I do have. It's just out of view over there. Um, and I think you're absolutely right, because the design with capacity, the design for you to play with, aren't they? That's the point. Upgrade this, replace that. I, is, is this all about consumers and on the go and everything being immediate and small is beautiful? I mean, is that your key message for me, Carl, that we've kind of got to stop the, the transition to anything smaller because it's just going to become impossible to deal with? We have designed ourselves into a bit of a corner there where the tendency is every single different thing that we have is completely custom designed. Uh, you know, you go to uh, something like a kettle and if you were to buy 20 different kettles and, and take them apart and analyze the design and say how many of those components from an individual kettle are, have in common with another one, you won't find any parts that overlap. Uh, and and that's, that's a struggle, and that's been a design trend over the last 20, 30 years, where there are very few common interchangeable parts. Um, and there's a you know, uniqueness. Every manufacturer wants to do things their own way. Um, yeah, the rise of wireless earbuds is something I'm really concerned about. Uh, AirPods are exploding in popularity. Everyone is going from your classic wired headphones to wireless ear headphones. Well, something like the AirPods, any of these true wireless earbuds that charging case that has a battery and then each earbud has a battery. So you're talking three batteries. Uh, they, uh, you, we cannot handle them in our solid waste stream uh, because they go into a trash truck uh, and they compact them and they cause fires and we have literal trash fires in garbage trucks 
uh, around the world on a weekly basis. Uh, you can't run them through a traditional municipal recycling stream because they cause fires in the shredders. You go to the electronics recyclers and talk to them and they don't want them. Um, so we don't have a waste stream set up to manage this. And yet AirPods were the best selling gadget of the Christmas season this year. So, so we have to rectify this. Uh, Armageddon is, is almost upon us. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm not are, wearing my, my pods. <laughs> yeah, I mean, everyone, everyone wants them. I like to say friends don't let friends have AirPods. Uh, but this is a behavior that is becoming normalized. It's a product that is completely unethical. It shouldn't exist. Um, and yet the use of the product, it's a great product that works really well for the first 12 to 18 months. And then the batteries wear out and then you check them in a drawer. So on, on that, Rachel, I, you know, the question is about, you know, the transition, uh, consumer behavior, expectations. We, we all want to live in the moment. Everything's about convenience and, and small. Um, are we fighting a trend that we can't fight? I mean, is, it, is, uh, is this too difficult? You know, it's, the thing is, every, almost you could say everybody's different. And that's why we go down the path for some of these items. And I think... It, 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 everybody, you know, you could say everybody likes convenience, but I think it's a level of convenience. Um, we've done um, something called segmentation, where we've divided people into certain groups, let's say, based on values. So they can be values around the environment or family or charity, just to get a handle on, on how people react to different elements. And I think, you know, it's one of those things, not everybody is the same. Yeah, there will be some people who want the latest gadget who place no value on their items they've got but equally you'll have people like carl who love to repair things who um want to share that with other people and then that is an additional challenge you know trying to treat everybody the same is you know incredibly different difficult so i think i think if we can break people down into groups we can find out the motivations and values behind them and they mem maybe find trigger points to say oh well perhaps you ought to think about this differently um, and we know some groups for example one group um on a recycling perspective will recycle more as long as they're just told to do it i mean how yeah. wonderful is that yeah there is a group of people that are like that you've got people who are thrifty people who think the climate is important so i think we can't tackle it all at once, Adam, I think. We have to break people down and think about how to tackle each group. Good advice. So the question for Brian and Kyle, are the people that want to fix things the same people that want to buy into Loop, or are we actually talking about two very different groups, do you think? Uh, Brian, you want to go first? Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, what, what we've seen with Loop is – you know, we, we built this thing to be convenient for the consumer. So really mimicking what consumers experience with disposable products where, you know, you walk in the store, you know, you got this pre-filled pack and you drop it off into an empty bin. In our case, it's an empty reuse bin, right? Uh, we've got a lot of catching up to do to, to create that infrastructure of reuse bins, which we're you know excited to say we're in the process of developing. But, you know, what... One thing that, you know, I think we see with durable, you know, design uh, that consumers appreciate is the fact that, you know, it's not just about sustainability, but that in durable design is in many ways enhancing that consumer experience um, in, in ways that uh, is, is really pleasantly surprising our partners, right? So uh, you had mentioned that haagen uh, partner in the past, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a great example because you know, we're not just talking about uh, a zero waste ice cream experience of a consumer eating their ice cream out of a beautifully designed stainless steel ice cream container, but allowing consumers to enjoy that ice cream at a frozen temperature for an extended period of time. Um, this is something that just simply is not possible with a disposable pack. Uh, it's being offered to consumers at the same price as the products are sold in disposable packaging, the only difference is the deposit. Uh, one thing we've noticed is there's not much sensitivity around the deposit uh, compared, uh, you know, between the US and France, there's a bit more sensitivity around that deposit in France versus the US, but as long as the consumer sends it back to the system, they have it back and that does not seem to be an issue. So uh, I do wanna bring that, that, that point to the table. 
Thank you. And Carl, do you think your, your you know, repairers are a, of a similar mindset to, to, to Brian's hagen das eaters? Uh, or are you, are you playing to the thrifty uh, or the youngsters of today, as, as, as Rachel may have alluded to? I don't know. I, I think that's an interesting question. I haven't, we, haven't, we haven't done the analysis. What I can say is that our people tend to be attracted to quality. Uh, and, and so you talk about a hog and dollars disposable cardboard container compared to the stainless steel container. I have a feeling if I got one of those, I would hang on to the container. I'd be like, this is cool. I'm using this. Thing. <laughs> We're going to make that, um, that deposit significantly higher, Brian, when you, when you start trading somewhere near car bought it. Sounds yeah, right. no, it's, it, it actually is a real issue, but you know, I think through some creative deployment of rewards programs and things like that, you can kind of, you know, incentivize the consumer even further to, to you know, send back the product in the system and, and not hold on to it. But it, it is a, a dilemma that, that uh, you know, we need to be prepared to uh, address. It's a good dilemma. Um, right, let's, let's answer this one quickly. I'm going to ask each of you in turn, so get ready. Uh, how willing do we feel the industry, broadest sense industry, wherever you may be, is willing to change operations and redesign products in terms of increasing either the recyclability or the durability? Uh, and do we need to incentivize that uh, whether it be locally or globally. What do you reckon, Brian, you're live at the moment? Yeah, uh, I would say that, yes, there is an incentive, uh, perhaps not as much as you know we would want, but I, I do think there is a growing appetite out there. Um, why? I think it's because there's a growing awareness amongst the consumers, uh, the customers of these big companies around the just dilemma and, and uh horrors of disposability and the mess that it creates. Um, I think that if you talk to the executives of these big companies, almost unanimously, they see durable, um, reusable design to be the future. So I think they have an appetite to get a taste of what that future is, understand what are the implications of that future on their business today, since you know, we're seeing regulations pop up in you know, places all over the globe starting to ban single-use packaging, uh, incentivizing reuse. And you know, this is, I think, uh, concerning to these companies. So I think uh, you know, we would love to see greater legislation, more efforts uh, by government to incentivize reuse and, and you know, good design. Uh, but I, I do think there is a growing appetite. OK. And Kyle, difference of opinion or on, on the same page? I mean, we're, we take it from a different perspective where we're looking at everyone who is buying products and saying, how can I create the best experience for you in the moment that you're in, regardless of, of your motive? So I don't, I, don't want, uh, I don't want to have to wait for everyone in the world to make the altruistic choice. I want to uh, have right, the, the right choice for you in this moment. You have a vacuum. The switch on your vacuum broke. You could go get a new vacuum for $200. Or you can get a switch for $5 and in 10 minutes, right? We have to make it to where it is easier for you to fix what you have than it would be to go to the store, get a new one, and then figure out what to do with your old one. Uh, and, and, and that's and, where we're aiming. And, and is that through incentives or disincentives, potentially, by making, you know, almost by subsidizing the repair costs or by making the, the original purchase more expensive so that it becomes a... I mean, you know, we could go into higher mode here, couldn't we? Why do I need a, a Hoover or a vacuum cleaner in the US when I could, um, when I could lease one and, and you repair it for me, Mr. Dyson, or other brands are available. Um, is that not a consideration here? That's an option, and it certainly works in certain markets. It aligns in some as well. Uh, but many products are so inexpensive that it doesn't make yeah. sense to do that. Uh, many vacuums these days are, are so cheap. If you, let's, let's take a $200 vacuum. If you want to roll a truck and have a service call on, on a vacuum, uh, that's going to end up costing the manufacturers, say, $100 all in with the part and the logistics and everything. Um, so I think we have to bring consumers into the mix and say, like, you don't need a professional trained repair person to fix a vacuum. Anyone can do it. Uh, it does not take very long. Uh, the parts are available. Uh, these things are incredibly cheap. I have a refrigerator. You look at like the, the cost to a waste stream and, and the, the amount of food waste. If you have a refrigerator that fails, uh, on the refrigerator, there's a compressor. On the compressor, there's a wear item that's a startup capacitor that helps the, the compressor kick on. My, my refrigerator, uh, it, it stopped working, like no cooling. 
no power, nothing. Uh, it was a you know ten dollar capacity. Just unplug it, plug the new one on, and it's good to go. Uh, so the idea that we should be rolling trucks and having professionals out doing this kind of service is crazy. Uh, we we have a world full of people that are perfectly capable of doing these repairs. I, I love your enthusiasm and your idea of empowering the, the masses to, to do the easy thing. Would that break warranty though on, on many products? Would, is that a concern for the punter? So this is a uh, international panel. That is a very hard legal question to answer across all the countries <laughs> that are represented here. So I'll, I'll answer it from the U.S. perspective. Uh, there is a because this is like highly specific to warranty law in each country. In the U.S., it is not legal for companies to void the warranty if you do repairs yourselves. Imagine you buy a new car and you're like, I want cooler tires on this car than th those that came with it, right? You put aftermarket tires on your car that does not void the warranty on the car. It's the same thing with doing service on vehicles. The other thing is we talk about warranty lifespans. Warranties are typically 12 to 24 months. That's Most scary. of the time we're talking about product failures. It's not in the first 24 months of the product. It's after that. Uh, I, that you know, people Rap did this wonderful survey that showed how dissatisfied people were with the lifespan of their uh, appliances. But we're talking about lifespans of five years, right? That we're frustrated it only lasts five years. Well, find your refrigerator with a five-year warranty doesn't exist uh, so, but that's when they, they they start to fail so what in warranty repairs you know that's about product defects out the gate uh but when we talk about product lifespans these are we're we're aiming for lifespans that are dramatically like 5 10 20 times the length of the original warranty thank you so that's a good segue back to rachel uh it's great that the states are reading rap reports that so you didn't know you were so global did you um how do you feel about industry innovating and, and, and such like, uh, is it happening? Are we confident? I think one of the reasons RAP works on voluntary agreements is collaboration. And I think we've alluded to it across. There's everybody has their part to play in this. So it's not only, as Kyle said, of getting the big companies to make changes, and make things easier. But it's also people, people who have skills, who can share stuff, who can do stuff. So I think it has to come across the piece. And, and Adam, you said it yourself, there's no point creating this new thing, let's say, to help us all reuse and repair if the householders, consumers don't want to use it or don't see the value of it. So I think, I'm not dodging the question, okay. but I think it's across the, the piece. I think, you know, if we take clothing as an example, you know, you know, sewing on a button, you know, is a skill that something is something that most people could learn to do or most people could do, but whether they want to do it is, is another matter. Another area to look at is the emerging um, markets for selling your secondhand clothing, particularly Depop, which has just appeared, I think it's the UK, where people now, when they buy something, some are actually looking at their resale value, you know, through some online channels. And that's a whole new way of thinking to buy something, knowing you're going to sell it um, at mm. the end of it. So I think, you know, a lot of creativity is coming from SMEs, from startups, from, you know, different online platforms to try and get us to value these as goods that if you don't want it anymore, that's fine. But let's think about something else. Can you reuse it? Can you resell it? Can you sew a button on it? So I think okay. it has to be across the piece, not just one person in this. Thank you. And, and on the textiles, particularly fast fashion, should we be um, uh, requiring uh, garments to be repairable, recyclable, high in recycled content? You know, there's lots of other things it could be. Uh, should we just be pushing that lever further quicker? Well, we know, it, you know, it's happening, you know, across Europe, um, in the UK, they are looking at ways of increasing, let's say, sustainability in clothing, whether it's recycled content, whether it's clearer labelling on durability and, and recycling, um, whether it's, you know, a move to more sustainable fibres, you know, or fibre to fibre recycling. So I think there is a, a lot happening. And I think, there's a lot of, if you look at social media, um, there's a lot of chatter about sustainable clothing and, you know, there's a, there's, there's a willingness there to move forward. And I think definitely, yes, um, we're probably in the middle of the journey of taking the citizen and the consumer there, um, but we're not there yet. But yes, definitely. Um, I think, you know, clothing, you know, we, we, we say at RAP that we think clothing's the new plastics, you know, with obviously plastics dominating the, the chatter at the moment. We think clothing can be next. 
Maybe Thank you. Course, I don't know. <laughs> but... <laughs> I, sounds like we're going to need another webinar on this. But anyway, I, right, we're going to go some quick fire now. So, Brian, one for you. When is Loop going to be available in Florida? Very good question. Um, we're currently live in about 11 states in the U.S. Northeast. We'll be live in the West Coast later this summer. In Florida, still TBD. Uh, but uh, for those you know, in other places across the globe, we are bringing Loop to the U.K., uh, later this year, uh, we're very excited. This is going to be in partnership with Tesco, our, our initial retailer partner. Um, we're also bringing Loop to Japan, uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, Toronto, Canada, uh, as well as uh, Germany all in the next 16 months. Absolutely fantastic. And Kyle, if you're thinking about buying something with repairability at the back of your mind, what's the one... What's the one thing you should be looking for in the electronic space? What, where would you put punters? What would you suggest they think about? Well, so interestingly, there's no way to tell if you if you go to a store and you're looking at buying a smartphone. They don't. There's no there's no label. There's no information that you can use. So I fix it. We have uh, put out uh, repairability scorecards for laptops, smartphones, and tablets. So go on, I fix it. Hit the repairability link, and then you can see. Uh, and you'd realize, oh, wow, the iPhone is repairable and the Samsung Galaxy is not. But that, that's not obvious out of the gate. Fantastic. Uh, I, so I would say when it comes to other products, uh, I like to shop by weight. Like the heavier the thing is, probably the easier it is to fix. Uh, <laughs> and, and if you're looking at, at electrics, if you're looking at, at things like washing machines and refrigerators, look online, look at, pick, pick the product and, and look to see if you can get service parts from the manufacturer. If you can, that's the best indicator. Thank you. Good plugs for both of your organizations there. I like that. So, so tell me um, a quick question around circular economy, stakeholders. That's what you are. You're, you're trying to do things that are different from our existing system. How do you view the Starbucks ban on reuse refill programs in response to COVID-19? And this is, just, is this just one example of how our new systems could collapse around our ears because of, you know, changing global pandemics Question mark. So um, who's going up first? Rachel, you first. What's your thoughts on, on what's happening with Starbucks? Other brands, are, uh, of course, are, are in this loop. So I think um, as part of the work we've been doing um, around a reuse and refill, particularly in relation to plastics, there's been a lot of questions asked about you know, how clean is clean, um, both in terms of physical clean and perception clean. Um, so the University of Sheffield, I think, I think Harriet's joined actually, have been doing some work about um, how clean does a, a water um, cooler have to be or how dirty before people consider it dirty and not usable. So I think there's big debate about clean and obviously Brian and the loop will have um, certain standards to reach. And I think some of it is perception and some of it is actual. And I think the actual particularly probably around the virus, we don't have that information. And it's probably from a risk perspective, better to err on the side of caution um, on, on that. So I think there's a lack of information to probably make some of those decisions around how clean is clean. And then there's a perception issue to continue to consistence to reassure them that clean is clean. Um, the challenge is if you're bringing stuff from home, you know, and the some of the models, the refill models, the cups, some of the other supermarkets, it's where that, um, is it with the householder? Is it with the retailer handling it? And I think that is a difficult area as well, particularly in the UK, um, that's a point of um, generally you have to risk assess it and decide where the risk is. So um, it's cool. a really interesting question coming at a time where some of these models are just getting going yeah. away and we don't yet have the knowledge and information to answer all the questions. No, and, and let's hope that it doesn't derail what could be some yeah. really important model development, if you yeah. like. Question for, for Brian. I'm not going to throw that one to everybody. Uh, so, Brian, this whole idea of making uh, reusable, refillables as convenient as possible. Uh, the question is, are we, is that actually a losing fight? Because it can never be as convenient as disposable because the disposable is too simple. Um, so do we need to repackage the way that we sell refillables? And it's about the lifestyle. It's, it's about the hagen dazs experience, for want of a better phrase. Um, is trying to be norm the wrong type of approach here? Yeah, so you know, we, we really built Loop in response to seeing this, you know, growing trend of, you know, refill stations and stores where, 
you know, in that model, consumer needs to physically go to the store, refill himself or herself. And, you know, for us that, you know, isn't going to do the trick, especially if we look at scalability. Um, the difference with the loop model is everything arrives to you already pre-filled. There's no additional work for you um, in your participation loop. There's no cleaning required. Um, all you need to do is simply, uh, you know, have your products uh, placed into a reuse bin versus a trash bin. So um, I, I will challenge, you know, that point of convenience, uh, you know, given the fact that, you know, we are mimicking the disposable uh, packaging experience as much as possible in that respect. So that for us is fundamental um, and uh, is, is, is how we're, we're building the platform. Cool. Kyle, uh, let, let's take this one with you. The idea of renting, um, you know, there's the whole issue about autonomous vehicles and some of the brands that were getting quite a bit of a, a, a pasting last year about uh, when, when it goes wrong. You're in the probably, you know, I, I don't see this being necessarily an issue for, for, um, for textiles, but I do see it being an issue for, for uh, electronics. Where, where does the responsibility, where does the liability lie when it goes wrong in that kind of renting model? Because if it is Samsung or uh, Apple and, and I'm just renting the space, you know, how do we make sure that we don't, you know, we, we're not creating a bigger problem perhaps? Well, if you're renting the product, then the, it comes to the owner. The, the, it's the manufacturer is the owner and the manufacturer and all the liability is on them. Uh, in, in, a, in a, you know, a traditional uh, model, it, it's more nuanced, right? I bought a car from Honda 10 years ago. At what point does the responsibility shift from them to me or the person doing the maintenance? Uh, and that's where we have uh, you know, lots of case law. This is what, what, what lawyers are for, uh, is, is deciding you know, where that, that carry on responsibility is. But I don't think, I mean, of all of the challenges that we're going to run into transitioning to a new economy, I don't think liability is the issue. That, that'll settle out. Every, everyone uh, along the chain has insurance. Uh, the insurance will price in uh, the 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 you know the risk factors. Uh, we work with with manufacturers a lot on liability. We have a partnership with Motorola, where Motorola sells repair kits and is enabling consumers to do repairs on their products. Uh, and uh, we also have a partnership with Patagonia, where we're teaching people how to repair their clothing. And I can tell you, the risk factor repairing an item of clothing is much higher than repairing a, a cell phone. Uh, like using it, like tr try using a sewing machine if you've never used one before, and not stabbing yourself with a needle. <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's an effort, um, and and so th that's just part of the the world that we live in. We we you know we're surrounded by risks. We manage those risks, uh, and it's up to so the in individual and the manufacturer to work through that. Quick, quick one for each of you, and I mean quick. I want a soundbite answer about online purchasing and, and whether or not, you know, it plays to, to Brian and Loop, obviously. But I mean, is online purchasing a great opportunity for refillables, repairables, improved durability, or, or actually is online purchasing making making the whole consumer interface much harder? And I assume Rachel, let's start with you because you're the you're the consumer expert on the group. So I guess it goes back to my question about every, every product is different in a way and, and the online experience for it might be slightly different. So it's quite hard to generalize. Um, so if you take clothing, you know, one of the things that you, know, you need to think about is, is the way that we have accepted being able to pay by multiple sizes of everything and just returning them. Um, or in some cases, some of our stats show not returning them. Um, and they go straight from, you know, online purchase to the charity shop or end up at the bottom of wardrobe. So I think online purchasing in some ways gives you that ability to maybe put less value on it um, because you can order multiples. But equally, online purchasing gives you a chance to give you lots of messages, um, you know, as you purchase things you can tell people the durability and you know, as Kyle was saying, repairability is just not on a product. So online maybe can give you an opportunity to give more messaging. So I think it, it can be both good and bad, let's say. Or... Sure. And then Brian, you know, somebody that's going to be in this space or an online platform. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as I mentioned, we, uh, we are an online platform. We are also enabling it in store. So uh, just imagine being able to walk into Tesco, there'll be a dedicated aisle of loot 
So that is also going to be an option. But to address the question on you know, e-commerce specifically, uh, I do think it's a fantastic platform because it really keeps the, uh, the loop closed, right? So, you know, what goes out comes in and it really allows us to, uh, you know, maintain that convenience for the consumer that, you know, is certainly um, a, a challenge as you noted earlier. So I, I do think that is going to be an important factor in getting the wider economy comfortable with this transition to this new uh, a way of consuming goods. Cool. And then finally, Carl, your thoughts on, on the online? I mean, clearly, most of your advice is online, isn't it? That's where you're giving guidance. Yeah, traditionally, uh, the information uh, advantage has been in the hands of the manufacturers. If, if you look at when did we shift toward most of the, the electric devices in our lives being disposable, it was in the 80s and 90s. Uh, you had CAD manufacturing, allowed manufacturers to have dozens of kinds of models of products. Now, uh, all of a sudden, it, it's flipped. And so if I have a very specific model of a Starbucks barista espresso machine, I might not know anyone in my life that has one, but I can go online and I can find that information. So the information advantage is starting to move back uh, onto the consumer, which is fantastic. Uh, the other thing is the number of parts that are involved in these things are, are so extensive that you might be able to go into a local super or market and buy a barista espresso machine, but they're not going to stock all the service parts for that. So you have to turn to e-commerce uh, for something where you're talking about dozens of times as many SKUs as you have for the original product. Fabulous. I'm conscious of time. Uh, I'm going to ask you one final question. I apologize to those of you online that have asked very technical questions or really explicit questions around a product or a brand. I'm parking those for a moment. What we would do is share those with the relevant expert and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll answer that offline for you. Um, so the final question I want to ask, and um, we'll start with Brian, then Carl, Rachel, last word with you. What is the one thing you would ask for or do to make reuse, refill, repair, take your pick, uh, easier and more convenient for consumers as opposed to them living their disposable lifestyle. So Brian, what's the one thing, one thing? Encouraging those partners of ours that are going on this journey to really have fun with the design of their products and packaging. I mean, one of the most beautiful things with this transition to a reuse economy is being able to invest so much more in your product, which will, you know, hopefully inspire and excite that change in consumer behavior we need. So I really think beautiful design is the thing that I would want. Beautiful design. Oh, hashtag. I'm loving it. Uh, Kyle. Uh, we have to flip the default. Products need to come with information on how to fix them and manufacturers need to start selling parts again. Uh, and if they're not going to do it willingly, we're going to have to pass laws to force them to. Fabulous. So flip the default is the second hashtag. This is brilliant. Rachel, what you got for me? Oh, so difficult. It's a very generic one. I would say, um, so thinking of Kyle here, partly, but then clothing as well. You know, people are wonderful and people have lots of skills that they don't know they have or they just need a bit of help. You know, sew on a button, speak to someone about repairing a coffee machine, you know, um, get things talking. You know, it's amazing probably what we can do if we all look at each other's skills and, and interests and information. Maybe we can help each other. Fabulous. So a bit of positivity sharing, sharing our experience and skills. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Brian. Um, if anybody can get Tesco's to get a loop dedicated aisle, then, you know, you're, you're a better man than I, because that anybody knows Tesco's knows that's a hard graft. Uh, Kyle, your passion is, is outrageous. You've absolutely convinced me to make you a, a regular kind of hotspot on my, uh, on my trawl of the internet to get uh, guidance on how to fix these crazy pieces of IT that I seem to walk around with constantly. And Rachel, it's an absolute pleasure to work with you again. We've been working with you in the Plastic Pact, but as many people know, you and I go back decades and it's always good to see that we're still talking about rubbish and resources in a positive light. So uh, a huge thank you from me. Uh, I've been your chairman for the last hour, um, Dr. Adam Reed, the External Affairs Director at Suez. This is a massive topic. And in many respects, we could have had a session on loop a session on textiles, a session on repair, and who knows what more. So if you've 
as an audience, if you've got topics that you feel we need to drag more detail into or flip the perspective, let Sweater or I know, and we will make sure we put programs on that can, can accommodate that because an hour is only a short period to dig deep. But I think we've done a fantastic job. So thank you, panel, and thank you, audience members, for your questions. Sweater, back to you, and thank you from me. Thank you, Adam, and thank you to all the panelists. This was really an interesting discussion, and it was very interesting for me because where I come from, uh, I'm in India, repair is exceptionally common around here. We don't throw away stuff that quickly. And I would also like to mention to Kyle that I have used iFixit so many times to fix quite a few things in my own household. So uh, thanks a lot, and thank you. We've not been able to answer a few uh, questions that's been come out, and they're very easy to contact. Adam is very easy to contact. He's online. I mean, he's, when he's awake, he's on Twitter. So I think you can drop us an email if you have any specific questions. We'll make sure that we could uh, respond to your email. I'll ensure that your email gets forwarded to the right panelists as well. So thank you all. And uh, yeah, wherever you are, good day, good afternoon, good morning, good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Cheers.